Hello, reader. I'm Alex. And I'm Kelly. And this is The The Lit Joy Joy Podcast. Podcast. Today's episode of The Lit Joy Podcast is brought to you by Lit Joy's special edition books. So one thing that we are very much known for is how we do beautiful special editions, ones that you want to collect, put on your bookshelf, and they really are like a piece of artwork Mm -hmm. when you purchase these. So some of the things that we do to all of our special editions, um, we do beautiful cover art, oftentimes very different than the original publication. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we don't ever stop there. We do the covers completely new, and then we always love to do more inside as well, right? Um, including the page edges. The page edges that we do are usually digitally designed or can have the beautiful like gold or silver um, gilding color on it. The other thing I think that's super unique to LitJoy is we do annotations in a lot of our special editions. Yeah. Not every one, but there are many that include annotations, which are the handwritten notes in the margins of the books from the author, where yes. they can talk through some of their thoughts as they were writing those little bits and pieces um, in that moment. You can kind of see some of the story arc of how they got to where they got with different characters. So it's just a really cool treat to be able to see inside the author's head as you're reading through the book. Yes, and then um, if we're able to, we also try and get the book signed by the author. So they are a signed edition as often as possible. Uh, Other little perks or additional things we put in there is we often provide extra illustrations, Mm -hmm. whether those are tip-in pages throughout or on the end pages or on the signature page. There's extra beautiful collector artwork. There's an array of options And we are adding new books throughout the year to our special edition collection. So whether you read fantasy or classics or romance or Mm sci-fi, we work with such a variety of fiction authors that there's probably something there for you. So to check out all of our special editions and just all the books that we're doing, go to litjoycrate.com forward slash books. And that's B-O-O-K-S, books. All right. Welcome back to the accidental two-part episode. (laughs) We can never get through our show notes. It's fine. We just love to chitty chat with one another. We have a lot to say about the books. We have a lot to say. So we'll stop. This is part two of our books that we're recommending if you love Sarah J. Moss's books, whether it was in if you were introduced to Throne of Glass, Crescent City, or A Court of Thorns and Roses, we have recommendations for you. Yes. And I will say, um, I will say that this is not an exhaustive list. This is just like the next reads if you have a bit of a Sarah J. Moss hangover, a massive hangover. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm (laughs) I make no apologies. I shouldn't. You shouldn't. I I was like, I liked it. (laughs) Uh, So our part one episode, we focused a little bit more on some of the more like the young adult high fantasy kind of feel that you would most likely see if you really love like Throne of Glass, although those elements are in all of her books. I would say yes. I would agree with this. I I would say yes. yes. We tried to pick books on the first list that were a little bit more like epic and perhaps more drawn out in like massive world building and multiple settings and Mm -hmm. uh, which I think that, you know, Akatar does that too, but the continent is kind of like I always think of it as like the UK. Yeah. Like what's like happening around the globe. Corinthian, you know. Yeah. The, like the, there's like multiple continents in Throne of Glass and yeah. she's traveling across oceans. And whereas in uh, Akatar, it really is kind of all happening right on Corinthian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it feels a lot like the UK. It yeah. even kind of looks like it in yes. the map. And so I was like, oh, they're down in Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not really what it is. It's the summer court, you know. <laughs> I know, but there's also kind of this cool thing that happens in Akatar where different places almost have, like, magical seasons, like, mm-hmm. everlasting seasons. And um, do you have a favorite court, like, for the setting? Mm. Because specifically, I would have said the autumn court if I hadn't read the books and been like, perpetual fall yes please yeah but they're all kind of dicks there i know i was like but that really ruins it i know right it's hard because we get so much in regards to like the night court yes that one's hard to pass up because it just seems so cozy all the time i know you know in the summer court i was kind of like "Eh, it's hot all the time yeah i don't you know (laughs) <laughs> and then Tamlin's running spring court, so no, no, he's running summer court. Oh, spring! No, I thought he's it was spring. He's spring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's spring. where I was like, I don't know how we're gonna deal with that. Yeah, that's right. Because summer court, yes, is summer court's by the ocean though. Yeah, it feels kind of like Caribbean sexy vibes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's so, and then there with Dawn Port. Dawn, that's what I was thinking of. Yes, yes. Spring Court feels a little stuffy. <laughs> stiff. We'll call it that. Stiffy. <laughs> Read the book, guys. No, um, I'm doing great. I, it is what it is. <laughs> so yes, Dawn Court, I think, is the one where it's kind of like it feels like an open palace with like sheer shades that flutter open, and like a fog rolls up, and you're like, wow, this is mystical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how hmm. <laughs> Jack, like that's a great description. Thank you. <laughs> Eyeball. There you go. I'm just so. saying it's interesting to me how I I how everything functions kind of like Earth on in Throne of Glass, where there's like seasons. Yeah. And it feels more Lord of the Rings esque. Yes. And I felt like uh Court of Thorns and Roses felt a little more fairy tale esque. To me. Yeah, it, it feels like this magical continent that is like in the Bermuda Triangle or something. Yes. That w- it currently exists, but we just don't know where it is. Totally. Uh, but it's just its own little mini the island. Land of Fae. With a couple of humans in the bottom. <laughs> We're like, wah, wah. Oh, yeah. They're right. like down there at the bottom of the continent. Just so. Being boring and human. <laughs> <laughs> well, as usual, we're a little unhinged in a good way. I love it. So this is going to be a fun discussion. We're going to be talking <laughs> about romanticy specific recommendations. I'm all very excited to talk about our the sexy side of uh, Sarah's books. Sexy Sarah. Ooh. And so romanticy is that mashup of, you know, romance and fantasy that has really seen a surge in people buying and being interested in this. Yes. And like praise where praise is due, Sarah was a huge part of taking the genre of romanticy from a more closed door to a more open door. I would say some of the authors on this list as well were a huge part in doing that. Yeah. So um, it is a massively growing genre and it's, I'm like here for it. So absolutely. I think it's awesome. All right. First on the list. Um, if you are looking for something that's fantasy with strong romantic themes, yes. um, it's the from Blood and Ash series by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Yep. And Jennifer is one of those, I would say, pioneers in the genre. Agreed. Yes. Um, I'm trying to remember because I've read some of her other books. I did too. I read the ones with the aliens. Yeah. It's uh, a like city Obsidian or an Onyx or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I enjoyed those as they well. They were fun. I just, they weren't as maybe fleshed out. They were much more focused on on the romance. I mm. felt like more like I was reading a romance novel with them with some paranormal elements. Yes. Whereas with From Blood and Ash, she really did do more in the world building. Yeah. There's like a lot more custom and culture that feel like fantasy mm-hmm. here. Um, it stars the main character. <laughs> it. Um, okay, so it there is a Poppy who's the protagonist. She's a maiden. Yeah. Right. Which comes with um, all of these connotations of like her as a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's going to ascend as a gift to the gods on her 19th birthday um, and becoming a part of the elite royalty who rule the kingdom. Right. So that's kind of the synopsis of her story. Then there's Hawk, who is just a little bit more on the debauchery side. Yes. Yes. And I find that their chemistry is really fun in the ways that Feyre and Rizand have a fun chemistry. Yes. Um, like he's always kind of a little playful with her and kind of pushes her to yeah. grow yes. um, out of her comfort zone. Yes, I would say that too. Um, but I will say this series, I don't know, every series I feel like in Romanticy, it is hard to have two people uh go hot and heavy in book one and then continue the excitement Um, throughout the whole series. So we've talked about this before. I preferred book one in From Blood and Ash. I thought that that was the best book in the series for me. Yeah. Because it was like new. There's like really cool elements of like, you know, like kind of like skeleton corpses and like some cool things that remind me a little Lord of the Rings and a little Mm -hmm. bit of like Like a witcher. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of witcher, kind of like some twilight moments in there too with like shape shifting and or like different I guess, like, love triangle, unexpected love triangle kind of thing. So it was an entertaining series. Yes. Book one felt very, like, new and fresh to mm-hmm. me, and I liked that one the best. Mm-hmm. In Akatar, I liked book two the best. Yep. And so I think it's it's hard to – it's hard because a series overall from Blood and Ash for me was kind of like a four-star, three-and-a-half to four-star, mm-hmm. but I really, really enjoyed book one. 
Yeah. And I mean, currently this is um, an unfinished series, Correct. but there are five books out and then there'll be one more coming, I believe. Yes. Uh, I, I can't remember. If it's, I think it's this year. I, uh, I or know. possibly next year. But Jennifer is the queen of pumping these books out. Yeah, like she's, she's such an amazing writer for like speed and like just the volumes of books that mm-hmm. she can put out. She's a mm-hmm. she's a queen of getting it done. <laughs> Sorry, for, I was thinking in a sexual con. I'm all, yeah, sure, actually that too. She gets that done too. Uh, what I okay, so with book one, I agree that I think I enjoyed it because you're getting a lot of the backstory. Yeah, um, about like this world. Mm-hmm. that she's creating and it's interesting because there are elements that feel very much like our world yes and, and then, then and then she mixes them in with like very fantasy and so it's a little back and forth for me on that like the world building because i'm like wait is this in world or am i like is this a fantasy world because yeah. she uses some terms that are known to us if that makes sense oh for sure like, I, okay i will say <laughs> if i'm being totally honest jennifer's writing i take uh is more of just like a romp through a fantasy kind Mm -hmm. of thing. It's a little bit more escapist. I feel like there is more of a polished tone to Sarah's writing. I would agree. And so I think when you're going into Akatar, you are getting a much more, I feel like, clean and edited fantasy series. Yeah. um, That has, there's been many eyes on it. Jennifer's books, many of them are independently published. Indie, she's an indie author with many of her series. And so I think that there is a little bit more looseness there. Where it's kind of like you're just, you go on the journey. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And I think that I I wouldn't be grading them on the same curve, right? Like, yeah, I, I had different expectations with From Bud and Ash. I agree. We read this for our book club, you know. So again, yeah. it's always nice because we can kind of pool a lot of reviews at yes. once. And I would say about two thirds of the book club were just like, I loved it. Like this yes. is the best. And then, you know, there was like a third of us who were, um, I, don't, I don't know if I fall into one or the other, but kind of had a few things. They're like, I don't know if I loved this part and yeah. kind of picked it apart more because they wanted more story is what it felt like. Yes. And then the other half of the group seemed to just be like, I just enjoyed the, you know, the romp, as you mentioned, like through yes. the story, because it feels a little bit more romance based yes. than like Sarah's in For sure. general. Or I think Sarah balances them really well. And so I'm like, this one leans a little bit more in the romance side. Mm-hmm. If you just, there are several scenes that she almost alludes to that you're just waiting as a reader to have happen. Yes. I'm like, is this going to happen in book two, book three? Like, I think that's what keeps, you know, pulling and leering them back yes. to keep going back because it's like, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. And this, I can't get into it because there's a lot going on in this series, but there are so many different <laughs> how do we, puzzle pieces of trying different things out. It's very, I don't like, how do I say it? It's kind of the books I feel like get more experimental as they go. Yeah. Like sexually. Yes. And I, sexually. I'm, I'm just going to say it. Like, <laughs> and I feel like if you're looking at fantasy novels on a spectrum of like polish to more like, um, like experimental or like more editorial versus like more indie. I Mm. feel like Sarah is definitely has like more eyes on her work and more editor um, focus. And it's more of a clean fantasy novel, not in, in con, sorry, not in like the sex, clean sex. It's it's more like, it just is more polished. And then I feel like there's kind of uh, like Rebecca Yaros, with like fourth wing, where it definitely pulls in some of that loose um, romance genre kind of yeah. like humor, where the humor in romance novels is like never really in world. It, a yeah. lot of it is um, something that just two flirty humans would be saying to one another, yeah. and it feels a little bit more loose. And then I think there's Jennifer and, um, and her work, which is, you know, like it's very experimental. And she's like, I did it because I wanted to see how that where the story would go. And yeah. it's interesting to like bring in paranormal and then to bring in fantasy. And then all of it has this strong romance yes. undertone with it. And um, and so I think it's nice to kind of bounce between the three as a reader so that you get like you're not just getting so bored with the same type of fantasy over yeah. and over again. Because if I only read Sarah... I think I would get really bored and it would get really formulaic. Mm -hmm. But that's the same with Jennifer if Mm -hmm. I only read Jennifer, right? And so I love that you can kind of take the strengths of all those types of authors and then like pull out what you love the most. Exactly. 
And that's exactly what this list is for. It's like we will try to give you a good idea of each of them to see if one speaks to you in what you enjoyed the most out of Sarah's books because yes. she's got so many little catnip things throughout her series. Um, and it kind of, and I think that's what there's always so much debate over. I like Throne of Glass better. I like Actor better. I like Crescent City better because yep. they each kind of highlight different elements, right? Agreed. Um, and uh, do you know where Blood and Ash falls? Is it like new adults or young adult? I, I don't um, think it's young adult. This has got to be no, it has, adult or, or new adult. It's either there. adult or new adult. And I bet you that they would probably categorize it, the publisher, probably new, adult. new adult, I would say. But it actually, new adult, I felt like was kind of a, a hot phrase for a little bit until we figured out what romanticy was. Yeah. And now I feel like it's it's like solid in the romanticy section, mm. right? Yeah. Or genre. And so there's kind of like that weird space where it's like, what is new adult? It really is just like fantasy YA that has sex. Yeah. Right. And so, because like there's nothing else that like they put really intense violence in young adult. Yes. So there's like nothing else that would qualify it to move from young adult to new adult except for like the sexual content, mm -hmm. which just puts it firmly in romanticity in my mind. Yeah. So fascinating. It's, isn't it interesting? Like human behavior. Like they're like, I need to know what I'm getting into. <laughs> <laughs> I've read up to book four in this series. And I will say like the content, like the sexual content definitely intensifies, I feel like, in each book okay. in a different way. And that's where I mean she gets really experimental and just with that as well. Because we've got in this story, you're going to have vampires, gods, primals, shapeshifters, um, which are basically like almost like werewolves, um, these snake filled zombies and Yuck. this like amarantha style almost like queen who's kind of evil yes. and so you've got a lot of paranormal stuff happening and i think there are different rules in with each of those like almost like cultures yeah of the different you know species types whatever you want to call it and so there's a lot to play with if that makes sense for sure which actually this from blood and ash as they go on they get more and more similar is a recommendation for Crescent City. Yes. Um, because in the beginning from Blood and Ash, I'd be like, oh, this is definitely like Akatar adjacent as far as recommendations are concerned. But then when more of the paranormal elements start to come yeah. in, I'm all, it's starting to feel a lot like Crescent City. Yeah. <laughs> which is book two on our recommendation list if you've finished Akatar and you're like, I need something. Yeah, we can move right on. And I was like, Crescent City by Sarah J. Moss. It's the most recent series that she has published, and she just came out with book three, yep. which I'm diving into this weekend. I'm very excited yeah. about. And then they've announced there's a fourth book coming. Yes, because we sure it fourth was, book. It was speculated, but not officially announced until you know a month or two ago. Yeah, for when we record this, but we're very excited because every one of her books feels like for me with Crescent City specifically, it feels like it's mini trilogy in it one book yes <laughs> they're, they're they're hefty, hefty. Uh, weapons and um you can weapons of mass destruction <laughs> i was just like i'll say i'll keep them coming all the puns. i love it it's so they're it's a lot like if you're going to read one of these crescent city books like it's a mini trilogy almost yeah. her book but it's it's incredible Okay, I'm going to just read the synopsis. I've read <laughs> book one and two. Um, Bryce Quinlan mm -hmm. had the perfect life working hard, perfect life, full stuff, <laughs> working hard all day and partying all night until a demon murdered her closest friends, leaving her bereft, wounded, and alone. When the accused is behind bars, but the crimes start up again, Bryce finds herself in the heart of the investigation. She'll do whatever it takes to avenge their deaths. Okay. I've said it once, and I will say it again. This is literally Zootopia, okay? For, for adults. For adults, okay? Because it's like, it was like Sarah was like, how do I incorporate all of these species that I want to? So there's like merfolks, and there's angels, and there's fae, and there's humans, I'm assuming, because can't leave them out. And then there's like weird godlike creatures. We're just not quite sure what they are. Anyways. So there is, it does feel like they would have to have special road systems for each yeah. species, like in Zootopia, yeah. <laughs> right? And then, but there's also, like in Zootopia, it's like a murder mystery, right? Yeah. Well, it's a disappearance This uh, is more mystery. like, almost like a contemporary romanticy. It, it, it also is in like Miami yeah. feeling, but it's, it's not, it's not a, on earth. Yeah, yeah. But it feels like Miami, the whole culture and the yeah. vibe and the weather and the beaches and 
Bryce is, she's like this curvy redhead, just like in From Blood and Ash. Yeah. So they kind of have that similarity, the mm-hmm. two of them. And um, she's she, like a wealthy badass art curator who turned private investigator. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. I'm all, okay, it's, it is a hard one to summarize because it is so lengthy. So I'm all, good job. And it only took me five it, minutes. <laughs> Well, and if you really enjoyed like Aelin from Throne of Glass, a lot of yes. people say there's you're going to see a lot of personality crossover with Bryce as well. Just, yeah. But the world systems are completely different. So it's not going to feel same, same. No, it feels very contemporary in that yes. there's like cars and trains and skyscrapers and yeah, and jets, right? And there's political systems. So mm-hmm. yes, in the mm-hmm. fantasy one, there's political systems. This one just looks slightly more similar to our political systems yes. as humans. It's fascinating uh, how she pulls in all these other species. Yeah. And, she, of course, she does the same found family mm. that you find in Akatar and Throne of Glass, where it's like, yes, we have these all these hot adults that yeah. are BFFs. And I'm like, yeah. Our favorite happens. trope is in it. So, like, if you want enemies to lovers, like you with, like, Resand and Feyre. Yes. Actually, all of hers. You know, all of Aelin and Rowan, I'm like, they're, they don't ever seem to like each other right off the bat. No. No. And so with, you know, Hunt is basically, he's like tasked with like protecting Bryce and they kind of hate that that's where they're at, where she's like, leave me alone. And he's like, I'd love to, but I can't, you know, like, yeah. uh, and there's reasons why, obviously, that he can't on top of just the fact that he's been asked to. Yeah. And so he has to stick to her like glue. And of course, he's just by the end of it, he's, he's head over heels. He's so ugly, guys. He's so <laughs> ugly. Lies. <Yeah. laughs> Of course, they're both super hot, like every great Sarah J. Moss novel. Super hot, and they just cannot hold back their passions anymore. So book two is where it's going to really ramp up. You get a lot of tension. Well, you do get, uh, there is, I would say, romantic, like adult romance scenes in book one. It's just um, not who you expect, It's but it is spicy. Yeah. And then book two really kicks up the heat, Mm -hmm. which is nice. And then I don't know about book three. I know. I got to like flip to page like 850 and see what we get (laughs) (laughs) out of the 1600 pages. No, (laughs) a little bit of less editing going on in these ones, guys. (laughs) Um, Okay. So as you mentioned, there are so many different kinds of creatures. I'm just going to read this office as there's fallen angels. Yep. Fae shapeshifters, this is cracking me up, Eleusian-esque merman, <laughs> demons, and um, I'm trying to remember, um, like, the little fire gal. What's her name? I totally spaced Ooh. it, but she's almost like an elemental. Yes, she's like she's like a fire oh, sprite. She's well, a fire sprite. Yes. Oh. Um, there's also, like, a chimera in yeah. it, which is cool. There's some cool things in there where she's, like, put it all in one book. There's also kind of, like, this cool... Um, like underground, like market scene that feels very much like something from like Star Wars or oh, yeah, yeah. where it's like this um kind of like shady marketplace where mm-hmm. there's kind of like a like a snake queen kind yeah. of vibe down. And it's like where you would trade contraband. Yeah. It's like drug deals. But it feels well, very like a mafia. Yes, but it feels kind of like something you'd see on like Star Wars, mm. like, anyway, so that's kind of a cool vibe. There's some fun settings or yeah. scenes in here, for I mean, sure. Obviously, if you like Sarah, you'll like her other works. And yes. so, Crescent City is the one that is still currently ongoing. Although, as a little preface, I believe we are getting more in the world of Akatar. Yes, uh, more with the second trilogy. I think it's supposed to be a trilogy. So there's oh. the first one we knew was Cassian. Um, and Nesta. And then I don't know if book two continues with them, but I think there's two more. Like, you mean like around Elaine, possibly? Or, yeah, maybe. Um, who's the third bat boy? Yeah, Azrael. Azrael. <laughs> I love Azrael. So I'm just like, I was like, I'm like, admittedly, Cassian's my favorite, but I'm pretty sure Azrael's probably more my type. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was like, Cassian would not be good for me, but it would be good. <laughs> You have your rebellious <laughs> moment with Cassian and just enjoy indulging there. And then you <laughs> Thanks for putting some structure around it. And you're going to get to Azrael. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. And I'm just over there hanging out with Rizan the whole time. I'm like, hey. <laughs> you're like, I'm really happy for you and Feyre. <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever, man. I'm kicking Feyre out. Like, bye. Yeah. I know. Although yeah. Rizan's arc kind of was a little bit of a struggle for me. But. It was a little. Here's the thing, though. I'm just like, um, oh, my gosh. I saw the 
pivot. Guys, I saw the funniest comment. You know when you see a kind of funny post on Instagram and then you read the comment section and you're like, this is where the gold is. Yes. There was um, a photo montage of Henry Cavill um, or Cavill, however you say it. Cavill, I think is how he says it. Um, A photo montage of him. So he's like not ugly. He's like the hottest man alive (laughs) throughout all time and all places. I feel that. I know, yep. right? And so there's this photo montage, and I'm like, yeah, Henry's hot. I go to the first comment, and it says, Henry Cavill was a man written by a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Born and that I way. was like, brilliant, because yes. that's the perfect description yeah. of him and of male characters in yes. female-written novels, yeah. where it's just like, obviously, a woman wrote this. <laughs> How they're, like, perfectly self-aware <laughs> yes. and always just, like, have so much space for the woman and all of her emotions. And, yes. And they're just, like, completely understanding and they're, like, step into your power. And yeah, all, they're, like, totally in their king era. Yeah, always. yeah. And I'm all, that. yeah, I get it. We love it. We, we were like, that's what we need. Everyone's <laughs> like, the poor men in all of our lives are like, I can't grow wings. Yeah, I, can't, I can do my best, but I cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I cannot be fake. <laughs> it's fantastic anyways thank you for going with us on that journey it was a journey uh so wrapping up with crescent city series uh that was our second recommendation nice and our third in this more romantic uh list is the serpent and the wings of night and this is the first book in the crown of niaxia by uh carissa broadbent um, okay, so this book we brought up once or twice before in other mm-hmm. episodes, and I'll admit I haven't read it yet. It's like totally on my list this year, and it gets recommended all the time if you like Fourth Wing, if you like Sarah's books. And so there's strong themes in all of those t- you know, series together with the romance and then the high fantasy. Um, should I read the synopsis? I don't know if I should read this whole synopsis. It's yeah, good. just kind of give them the first sentence in here because I think it kind of sets the tone for— okay. Like the car- the creatures in the book. Because there's a lot of words I don't think I can pronounce in this one. This is interesting. <laughs> so this is the first book in the Crowns of Nyaxia series and sets off into a world of powerful vampires and magical beings broken into warring classes with humans at the very bottom of the feeding line. Yeah. Ugh. So we've got it where like there's this gal. It seems like she's an adopted human um, of this vampire king. And, you know, she's grown from a girl, obviously, into a woman. And she's very like aware of the world around her. It kind of feels like um, Holly's books a little bit with like the cruel prince. Yes. You know, like the uh, someone being adopted into like almost a magical world. Um, Yes. And there's also kind of like a little bit Twilight-esque of like, I want to be a vampire too. Because she can choose to become immortal, it sounds like. And, well, to be a vampire, right? And there's this, like, tournament that's held by this goddess of death. And she can compete amongst these really vicious opponents and, you know, different vampires, basically. Right. Which feels very under the mountain, Amarantha Mm -hmm. kind of vibe. So it makes sense why it would work with that guitar. Yep. And so, of course, one of the, is it an opposing person? Like, let's see. Oh, yeah. Her rival. Uh, Rain? No, so she right. forms an alliance with the rival. So oh. they're they are pitted against one another, but then there's like an alliance that oh, comes you're right. into yep. play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and obviously Rain knows more than they're letting him. Yeah, right. And so uh, it it kind of finishes. It's like there's nothing more deadly than love. <laughs> yeah, and so I think it's like you so know, like, the, it's like the catnip. premise of book one. And... Yes, it's like catnip for like fantasy yeah. readers, where it's like. Like mysterious alliances and competitions, yeah. and uh, there's this similar kind of theme to Aelin and being like the underdog mm. in some ways, or like kind of unassuming heroine, or like not all is revealed kind mm. of a thing. So it feels yeah. because also in Throne of Glass and in Akatar, the the main protagonist has to kind of compete. Yeah. At a certain point and and like prove their skills or um, survive. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and it sounds like with the love interest, it sounds like forks, forced proximity as well as enemies to lovers. Those tropes seem to be threaded through there, which are always part of our favorites. And um, so this one does, like you mentioned, has a lot of like themes with Throne of Glass with this unassuming heroine and competition. And it's just going to, you're going to, if you love the strong heroine, that's kind of the vibe I get for this book on top of, you know, the romance is going to come in and be really engaging, but I feel like it's going to ramp up in the, you know, 
additional books that are out in the series. Yep. I'm like, it's on our list for this year. So we won't speak too much more on that since we haven't read it. We're not, um, but I'm really excited. It's got great reviews. Um, and I'm like, mm, that'll be my summer read. Yeah. I'm decided. I have like, good. I plot my books out for the year. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm like, I, I just kind of make my list and then I'm like, what do I feel like reading mm-hmm. this month? And then I kind of do it there month by month. Plus I have like four book clubs that I have to like, keep <laughs> up with. Most of them are self-inflicted book clubs. It's fine. I love it. All right. Okay. Number four, Ledge by Stacey McEwen. First of all, Stacey's a delight. Yeah. If you don't follow Stacey on social media, specifically TikTok and Instagram, I would highly recommend because she's a delight. She's a freaking hoot. She's hilarious. She's an Australian author. Mm -hmm. She became a TikTok sensation prior to releasing her first book. Yeah. I can't remember if it, if she started or just really enhanced the trend of like turning my husband into like, um, not turning, but like, you know, tr- treating him as if he were in a fantasy world with her. Yeah, that was her. So she'll be like trying to play out one of the tropes in fantasy she'll on her like, husband. <laughs> she'll be like, if I trip and fall, will you, is she like, she, I can do her Australian accent, but she'll be like, honey, if I trip and fall, will you catch me? And he's like, well, why are you falling? Yeah. And you're, she's like, that's not the point. Like, will you catch me? You know, can you just like fill up the doorway? Yeah. And she's like, can you smolder, like, honey? Yeah, smolder. And he's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. It is funny because what it is is she's like, it'll be like the. She's camera. like, I'm on my way to. It's know. like, do, 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 yeah. do. on my like, way to d- treat him like a fantasy character. Yes. On my way to d- d- turn my husband into a high fae lord. Yes. And it just shows her like tromping through her house and she gets to him and she's like, <laughs> she'll pick a fight with him because he has she, no clue what's happening yeah, yeah. most of the time like, she'll be like when you look at me she's like do your eyes turn dark and he's like you should get that looked at <laughs> she's <laughs> like no make your eyes darken when you look at me <laughs> it is it's true it's, you hear it in every fantasy like he looked at me with lust and his eyes darkened you know and and he's like that sounds like a problem <laughs> you should really <laughs> go to the like, doctor he's a cute guy yeah. like he's a cute like he seems like a great husband and such a great sport yeah so it's not like he's not picking up on what she's putting down i think he's just like the two of them together make the great point that <laughs> What works in fantasy doesn't always work in real life. Yeah. And he's like, that's toxic. <laughs> <laughs> They're a cute couple. And that's kind of like she was a budding author when she started getting really yes. viral, I feel like. Um, and it really helped. And so when she came out with her first book, which is, you know, Ledge, yes. which is in the Glacian trilogy. Of yes. Um, she had a really good response and a really good readership kind of built in. And I, I don't think that was like her reason for being on social it just worked out great no it just kind of worked out and she was a huge she did like book reviews and yeah. and um you know book talk skits and things like that because i think she's just an avid fantasy reader mm-hmm. and so we d- have done special editions of yes. her books one and two and, and we'll then, do the third and yeah. we're gonna do the third um and so what's really fun about these books um they kind of remember remember when way back at the beginning of Literary, like month two of Literary, we did Ivory and Bone. Yeah. And it was kind of like a caveman. Mm-hmm. Uh it was like it was like a prehistoric fantasy. Yeah. And this one kind of reminded me of that. Uh this one is, I would say, spicier. Yeah. Um, but it it kind of has a little bit of that like um dystopian, utopian, like not try you're like trying mm-hmm. to figure out why they're all living literally on the cliff's edge. <laughs> and, oh, you know what kind of reminds me of is the Abominable Snowman movie. What is that? Where, um, uh, Smallfoot? Smallfoot, yes. Oh. <laughs> Where they, like, don't know what's at underneath the clouds. Under the clouds that the elephants are holding up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so it's kind of has, like, this mystery right off the bat that they're, yeah. like, on the ledge of this cliff, and that's where they're surviving. Mm-hmm. And um, it has, okay, th- the ledge is a... Um, is all that Dawson Dawson has ever known. Her life exists in the limits of the frozen Mm clifftop, and time is marked by visits from the Glacians, evil creatures that look like winged humans who still ledge dwellers from the land multiple times a year. When she's taken by the Glacians, she knows she has to escape the monsters, even though their plans for her are a mystery. So... She has to accept help from Ryan, a half Glacian, who offers her a path down the mountain. And pretty much just there like, it is. Right obviously, there. you know, feelings for Ryan kind of stir. Yes. She's prepared for what 
you know, is coming her way, basically, which is love. <laughs> love. <laughs> love and more. Or spiciness. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be both. <laughs> It says her feelings for Ryan will stir in her. I love it. And so I know book one, again, is setting up a lot of the like yes. world building and uh, just the character arcs. And so book two is going to also ramp up in the spiciness and just really fun, unique series. Uh, yes. There's a lot of sexual tension. It's very smoldery. Enemies to lovers again. Big, like musty build up. And you're going to find a lot more adult spice like Resen and Feyre in this yes. one. Um, in that vein, even though there's definitely spice in Throne of Glass, but it felt a little more similar to Resent and Feyre. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, it's it's darling because, or, or not darling, it's it's fun reading these books and kind of funny because she jokes about smolder so much on her TikTok <laughs> and you kind of feel like you're friends with her yeah. while you watch her TikTok. And so to see it come to life in her books and that smolder is just like, it's a really fun full circle mm-hmm. moment yeah. that she got to kind of bring that to life. Also, a super strong female protagonist, yes. which um, I appreciate in a fantasy novel always. Yeah. It's great for us. I love when a, you know, 19-year-old woman can save all of humanity. It's like girl power. Yeah, 19. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm like, I could barely get dressed and get to college on time. <laughs> I was, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, at 19, I was a mess. Thank goodness the revolution was not in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to lead us to our last book series recommendation for this episode, which is Kingdom of the Wicked series by Carrie Maniscalco. Nice. I did it. Um, this is a really fun one. I love any sort of, you know, any if it's like mythical gods or yeah. Nordic gods, or in this case, it is, um, how would you, I'm like, what do you trying to think of what they're called but basically it's um what am i trying to say the deadly sins so the, holy cow that took yeah, me a minute they're it's the like, seven deadly sins we got there are represented by seven characters yes and of course they're all so ugly they are so hot right yeah. so i'm like she's like what's better than like three hot guys seven <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's, it's just like also catnip you're like yeah. yes okay so they represent like lust and greed and vanity, right? So you have envy. envy. And so it's so interesting how you can play with all these characters yeah. together um, and their different, you know, special skills. Their powers. Their powers that they represent. Yeah. Oh, man. It got steamy in this one. Like, it kind of caught me off guard because I I don't know, but I thought this was a young adult series. Oh, And I think okay. it is, possibly, but the tension that she creates is pretty amazing uh but i'm like dude if it's young adult i'd be a little surprised on one of the books because it gets pretty a little hot steamy a little steamy, steamy in there man yeah because you know like lust really plays it up when he throws like a big party nice and i'll just leave it at that but it's a really really unique retelling because like I never... neon gods plays it up no no like that's like full born like five four to five spice you okay, know like, got it, got it. i just think if it was young adult i'd be oh, like oh it's too spicy but whoa that's pretty and so i if it is young adult it really pushes the boundaries but i would say it kind of borders closer to new adult in the spice level for me okay. um but just having this really f- like amazing backstory of like these sister witches um on kind yes. of a special island and you know the the deadly sins who are actually people and so the I, the whole premise is just really unique it kind of reminded me of like yeah Corinthian. And mm-hmm. having courts, these different courts yes. that you go to, and each one is ruled by a different ruler, but they all kind of know about each other and sometimes have counsel, whatever. But most of the time, they act like they don't know what the hell's going on with the other one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, enter Kingdom of the Wicked. Um, um I uh, just got the title. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, ding, light bulb. <laughs> it's fine. But they're not all bad, right? Like, that's no. kind of the point is... There's goodness in a lot, all these characters, some at least, you know, there has to be. Uh, But Actually, that's an interesting point. I personally love the morally gray space. I think it's so much more interesting as a character. Not that I'm like, I mean, you know, not that that I want to in real life have relationships with people who don't have strong moral values. (laughs) But 
I think what I love about morally gray characters is that they shine a mirror back on us to realize that we also sometimes live in the gray with things, that some things cannot be black and white, that many things can't. And so I love when books like this set up a premise that allows Mm -hmm. for that morally gray exploration. I feel like uh, Lee Bardugo's a really good one for that. Yeah, She does such a good job in, in creating characters that are lovable and hateable or like that are, you don't know how to categorize them because that's such a human thing. Yeah. It's not clean cut. mm -hmm. You know, like Voldemort, you're like, he's bad. He literally like, there's nothing redeeming really happening here for sure. But in someone like, well, in this case, it'd be wrath. Yes. You know, and Amelia, those are the two main characters or even in, um, like shadow and bone, you've got the darkling, like you were talking about where you're like, I really like, but I I know know he's the, bad guy here but i kind of want to jump in but also like i couldn't take him home to mom like and so you can yeah, so there's that that's happening to describe it and then in this one with wrath you know he clearly has a lot of definitely everyone has a perception of who he is you know he's yeah. a prince he's a prince of um it's not hell is it oh yeah one of the princes of hell basically and love it so the island is hell yeah fun well no they're like basically somewhere in like almost like greece or italy yeah. and then they go to hell and just just the journey there to his kingdom i was whoo i had to fan myself it was good spicy mm-hmm. i loved it we have actually I, I enjoyed it so much we started we reached out and we we already, have a collection we have a collection with carrie because uh it's such a fun world and yes. there's a lot of elements you could bring to life in it. But instead, instead of Fae, Kingdom of the Wicked has witches and demons. So that's kind of the difference. And Amelia is a strega, which is witch in Italian. And so nice. it starts out in Italy and there's like a restaurant that they run and they own. And so right off the bat, it's fun because it plays with your senses with food mm-hmm. and things like that. And also um, there's a murder right away. Murder. Murder. <laughs> 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 I did. I went for it. And so, uh, and that's where like you learn about them being witches and what does that mean? What's what's been unlocked? And then you get to fall down that that rabbit hole of fun. Yay. <laughs> so what other themes? We've got betrayal, power, trust, and then just a lot of, you know, like we talked about morally gray characters. Um, another strong protagonist, romance, danger, passion, and betrayal. It also kind of had, again, a little bit of Cruel Prince vibes to me. Yeah. Um, But just definitely hot, like hotter. Spicier. Spicier, yeah. yeah. And so if you like Cruel Prince as well, in some of that fantasy and wanted a little more spice, this is perfect. I love it. I all right. love it. Well, that's that's all I got. That's all I wrote. <laughs> that's all she wrote, folks. Oh my gosh, we did it under 50 minutes. <laughs> you guys, thank you. Thank you so much. No, I love these recommendations. I think if they even pull one book from the list and it's their next read, I just love that people are interested in fantasy and romanticy more now than ever in my Mm -hmm. life. And so it's it's like such a fun genre to escape into and to explore things about yourself with, too, because there's like space. Yeah. Because it's fantasy. So you're like, it's not real, but like, am I into that? Or... (laughs) Do I struggle with that or do I identify with that character? I mean, I think it's kind of like all of us kids who grew up on like the fantasy classics Mm -hmm. are all, we've been here a while. Welcome. Ready. (laughs) We're ready for it. Yeah. I will say, I didn't add this to the list because it's on every list we ever do, which is fourth wing. Yep. That like, if you really just want something that's very similar, you know, to A Court of Thrones of Roses, um, that series is ongoing. And it's just really fun. And really fun. Yeah, I think Sarah's are a little heavier. Yeah. But if you just want like a delightful and escapist. Spicy. Spicy read. Heck, I like, might go back and reread Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing so and Iron Flame are out now. Yeah. And I think we'll be getting a third book this year. But uh, And there'll be five. So that's an ongoing series as well that we just are like, clearly this genre, like you have to mention it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've just brought it up so many times. So I was like, let's give some other recommendations. But Yeah, because there's other great ones. I think the thing that uh, Rebecca did that was interesting is she took the addictive quality of romance novels mm-hmm. and just applied that algorithm to a fantasy genre. Yeah. And so it is romance forward but she does a great job of this really fun world building. Mm-hmm. And I think the pe- reason people are so addicted to her books is because it starts with the algorithm for for romance. Yeah. 
There's what, like the meat brilliant. cute and the, you know, like there's just these plot points that you hit as a romance author mm -hmm. that are formulaic. And she's all, yes, but dragons too. And I'm like, that's why people are catnipping <laughs> this. They're just like, nom, nom, I can't It's stop. good. I mean. It, oh, it's so fun. I, I don't know how many romance authors, because Rebecca Yaros is a ro romance author originally. Yes. Like that's where she's always kind of stuck with that genre. And then she switched over to this like romanticy. I don't know how many romance authors can switch and add fantasy in because it's a complex world. It's a completely different type of recipe. Yeah. Uh, and so, and she did a beautiful job with it and it was spicy one. So fun and spicy and well, and on that note, <laughs> yep, I know. So, okay, well, that's our list. Uh, part one and part two, you get 10 to 11 book suggestions, plus a lot of other things that we talk about. <laughs> plus some interludes. You're welcome. <laughs> interludes for <laughs> books if you like Sarah J. Moss's book. Thank you, reader, for listening to this episode. Remember to rate and review us. And like a good book, recommend us to your friends.